Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, my name is Ben, I'm a researcher at the University of Bristol and I'm joined by Barry who is a principal security architect at NVIDIA and today we are going to give you a guide to the RISC-V cryptography extension. Um, the order of business looks something like this. So I'll start with an overview of the extension and our task group's approach to building it and give you a little sneak peek at where we are in the standardization process and how close we are to ratification. Um, I'll then give you a, a tour of the scalar cryptography extension and then I'll switch over to Barry who will talk more about the vector-based extensions. So when it came to building the extension, one of the great things about RISC-V, of course, is that it caters to pretty much everyone from sort of deeply embedded IoT devices all the way up to high performance compute and server class cores. And we needed to build a cryptography extension that would uh, do exactly that for everyone. Um, now historically, most industrial crypto ISEs tended to reuse the SIMD and vector registers. And that makes perfect sense when they're there because inputs and outputs to cryptographic operations tend to be quite large. Um, but of course, this isn't an option for small sort of 32-bit devices um, in embedded environments. And what we really wanted to do was lower the barrier to entry for secure and efficient cryptography so that anyone um, can benefit from it. Now, the solution we hit upon was to design two sub-extensions, um, one for small um, secure element or larger application class cores that don't use the vector extension. Um, and this includes the access to an entropy source interface for creating cryptographic secrets. So this is very much a new thing that RISC-V is doing. Um, and then there's also the vector extension for much larger cores that do implement the vector register file. Um, and these are uh, uh, sort of much more suitable for large server and application class cores. Um, there are things like single round instructions for AES and SHA-2 and general purpose instructions for SHA-3. Um, and that's what Barry's gonna talk about later. So, uh, the scalar extension. So this was really born out of a desire to make sure that any class of core um, that you're implementing on top of RISC-V can do secure and efficient cryptography. Um, it's split into two sort of major classes of instruction. There are some special purpose instructions that in a very lightweight way accelerate uh, very popular cryptographic algorithms. And then there are another class of general purpose instructions. Now, we needed this because the cryptography extension needs to support all kinds of cryptographic algorithms, not just the usual suspects from NIST like AES and SHA, even though they're very important. Um, and the solution we hit upon was to borrow uh, several instructions from the Bitmanip extension that we found to be really useful for cryptography. Um, this sort of borrowing of instructions from another extension, the idea being is to make sure that the cost of supporting these instructions, be it through verification, implementation, or through software, is as low as possible, but they're still available to all of the people who need them. Um, and this makes the extension much more general purpose for um, not just the usual suspects of ciphers, but other um, in-progress standardization efforts around cryptography, like the post-quantum or lightweight crypto things from NIST. Um, in terms of what we actually borrow from Bitmanip, um, of course, we need rotations. These are a core crypto cryptographic operation, really, really useful for uh, lightweight block ciphers. char char is extremely popular, um, and SHA-3, of course, which is really important for, for uh, post-quantum cryptography. Um, we also borrow the logic and not instructions. Uh, these are useful for bit sliced cryptography and for lots of uh, things like masking countermeasures. Um, the and n instruction is also very useful for SHA-3. Um, we include the carryless multiply instructions. Uh, these are absolutely essential for Galois counter mode or GCM, um, which is a mode of operation that is uh, used in TLS 1.3. So again, really important. Um, and then a grab bag of instructions that are useful for permuting bits and bytes, essentially. So things like endianness corrections, um, into, uh, implementing things like uh, SHA-3 on RV32, or for doing generic constant time SBOX operations. So this is important for um, ciphers like ARIA and Camellia, for which there's no dedicated support, but we still want to be able to do them in a secure and efficient way. So those are the more general purpose instructions that we include in the scalar cryptography extension. Um, and I'll now move on to the more special purpose ones, uh, starting with SHA-2. So SHA-2 is a very popular uh, hash function, um, part of the TLS standard used in all sorts of places. Um, and we use a very, very lightweight approach to accelerating it by uh, basically wrapping up the sigma and sum functions as they're described in the SHA-2 specification. Um, and you can see the kinds of operations that the instructions do there. They're extremely cheap to implement, basically doing shifts and rotations by constants and then XORing them all together. So they're very, very cheap to implement and they give you around about a 2x performance boost um, and they halve the size of your implementation. So 
um, very, very cheap, but with um, a sort of outsized performance improvement, which is really, really good. And moving on to the lightweight AES instructions. So the AES block cipher um, is extremely popular. It's the only block cipher mandated by things like the TLS 1.3 spec. So all of your internet traffic will um, interact with it at some point. Um, and it's got a very long history of implementation styles, uh, some of which have security implications. So f famously, it was shown that you could um, exploit it through a remote timing attack because one of the faster uh, implementation styles had secret dependent memory accesses. Um, so this is an absolute disaster, and we've gone to great lengths to make sure that um, our instructions don't suffer from this, of course. Um, even in uh, embedded devices where these um, secret dependent memory accesses aren't executable, uh, aren't exploitable, sorry, they are still very um, energy intensive as well. So eliminating those brings some benefit wherever you're using the instructions. Um, we decided to split our approach and have uh, different instruction implementations for RV32 and RV64. Um, this is simply because the number of bits you can fit into the instruction changes dramatically depending between the different base ISAs. Um, so it basically allowed us to tune the instructions to give the best solution for each base ISA and each base ISA use case. Um, and also to sort of balance the implementation and performance costs uh, relative to the size of the host core, which is really important. Um, again, because these instructions are so important, we've gone to great lengths to show our workings. Um, so you can see in the two academic publications at the bottom there, um, a lightweight ISA extension for AES and SM4 is the paper that um, describes the solution we chose for RV32. Um, and the final paper at the bottom there basically um, shows our entire sort of performance analysis and uh, design space survey of different kinds of instructions for scalar AES acceleration and gives the sort of rationale behind what we picked in the end. So if you want more information on our process for picking these instructions, those are some really great papers to go and look at. Um, and now I'm gonna describe each one in a bit more detail. So for the AES uh, instructions on RV32, uh, there are four of them. You can see them listed on the right-hand side there. Um, they take two source registers and a two-bit immediate to produce a single destination register result. Um, and they're based on a sort of T-tables in hardware approach. So if you're familiar with implementing AES and the sort of T-tables implementation style, what we've done is essentially take that, up, take that and roll the table lookup into a single hardware instruction. Um, the real benefits of this from the point of view of a lightweight implementation is that you only need to implement a single S-Box, uh, which is really important for small cores because uh, the S-Box is by far the most expensive part of AES to implement. Um, in terms of the actual software impact um, for performance, you get four or five times performance increase in terms of instructions retired. Uh, in terms of your cycle counts, this will vary depending on your memory latency accesses, um, but it's likely to be much more than four or five times. Um, takes you about 240 instructions to do an AES128 block encryption, um, which is sort of the most common use case, um, which works out to about 15 cycles per byte. So this is far and away better than what the competition can do. Um, and in terms of your uh, code size, um, about one third of the size in terms of uh, executable code and no data. Um, so again, really important for sort of that embedded use case. The hardware cost, again, very cheap, about 1K NAND two gates for in implementing both the encrypt and decrypt instructions. Um, in terms of how you actually use these instructions, so on the left there is a rather busy code snippet that implements one round of AES using these instructions. So we'll just walk through that. So first four instructions, load your round key. Um, the next four instructions, and then each block of four um, process one row of the AES state matrix. Um, so within row zero, the first thing we do is select byte zero of T zero, and that runs through the instruction flowchart on the right. So you apply the S box, then you apply the mixed columns linear transformation, because this is a middle round, um, and then you um, rotate the result and XOR it with the round key that you loaded in. So in one instruction, albeit for one byte, we've done add round key, S box, shift rows, and mix columns. So that's all steps of AES, all in one part. And then you can see there that we pick, in the next instruction, we pick uh, byte one of temp register T1. Um, the T registers in this case contain the previous round state matrix values. And then over 16 of these instructions, we process an entire round of AES. Um, so that's more or less what it will look like. I appreciate this is a busy slide, so if you want to come back to it later, please do. Um, now I'm going to move on to the 64-bit instructions. 
for the RV64 instructions, we allowed ourselves to design a little more for performance because um, once you realize that AES is a, works on a 128-bit block size, you can um, essentially provide the entire current round state as an input to one instruction. Um, although, because the output can only be one 64-bit register, you need two instructions to compute the entire next round. Um, this works out at about six instructions per encrypt decrypt operation, or 75 instructions per AES128 block encrypt. Um, so this is, again, much more performance focused, but still working within the constraints of two reads, one write in the register file. Um, to, just to show you in detail how the, the RV64 instructions work, um, the code snippet on the left computes two rounds of AES. So first off, you load your round keys. Um, the add round key step of the algorithm is performed with normal XOR instructions. And then we use two instances of the same AES64 instruction to compute the shift rows, subbytes, and mix column step. We also take advantage of the, the way the shift rows operation works, uh, such that if you switch the order of the RS2 and RS1, you can compute either the first two columns or the last two columns of the round output. So it's again, quite an efficient um, solution in terms of the required instruction encodings. So the final set of uh, algorithm-specific instructions that we support are for the Shangmi Chinese National Cipher Suites. Um, these are roughly equivalent to NIST SHA-2, so that's the SM3 algorithm, and AES128, which is the SM4 block cipher. Um, the SM4 instructions are very, very similar to the RV32 AES instructions I described earlier, um, only instancing a single S-box, uh, even to the point where you can share much of their data path and implement them together in quite an efficient way. Um, and likewise, for SM3, the hash function, uh, the instructions are very similar to the SHA-256 ones I described earlier. So I'm not going to spend too long on these. Uh, suffice to say that they're there and we support them. So the final component of the Scalar Cryptography extension is an entropy source interface. Um, I'll give a very brief overview here, but if you want more details on how uh, this was designed, you can see the associated paper at the bottom there, um, put together mostly with thanks to Marku. Um, the, whole interface has been designed to make uh, access to a uh, cryptographic entropy source as simple and easy to use as possible, um, and more importantly, difficult to misuse. Um, so it's been designed with things like FIPS 140-3 or AAS 31 certification in mind as well. Um, so for particular applications, that's really, really important. Um, it's not um, comparable to things like Intel, uh, Intel's read round instruction, and the, the reasons for which are explained in the in the paper. Um, the idea was to uh, minimize the uh, implementation costs so that this can be used across uh, not just very small secure elements, but it, it will scale up to sort of larger server class cores. Um, the idea being to provide a very clean CSR based API access to an entropy source that makes the um, abstraction boundary still very clear. Um, and this, what we've what we've built, enables a single software driver for all implementations, um, and we also include a space for a vendor customizable CSR noise interface, which is really important for um, validation and certification programs. Uh, we've also gone out of our way to make sure that there's very clear guidance on how to use this safely. Um, for example, uh, all of the samples need to be crypt cryptographically conditioned, and all the, the rationale for that is explained in the specification. Um, in terms of what the um, pole entropy instruction looks like, well, it's an alias for a, a CSR read, um, and what you get back is a is the same on RV32 or RV64. It's basically a status code in the top bit. Uh, the status code is either uh, BIST, which indicates that the noise source is currently undergoing sort of self-test and will come back to life eventually. Um, you, or you get uh, ES16, entropy sample 16, which means that you've got a valid 16-bit sample in that seed field there, and you can use that uh, to add to an entropy pool, um, but it must be cryptographically conditioned before it's used. Um, then there's the wait state, which means that the noise source is still gathering entropy, so it hasn't quite produced a sample yet. Uh, or there's the dead state, which means that your noise source is damaged, it can't produce enough entropy to be used safely, and so must shut down. Um, again, this is really important for certification programs. Um, the idea, so you can see on the right there, that sort of flowchart diagram, is that uh, implementations like a secure element would periodically poll the entropy source and add the valid seeds to an entropy pool, which then gets cryptographically conditioned and can very quickly be used to sample large amounts of randomness. Um, the instruction is only accessible in M mode, 
So uh, for something like uh, Linux, you would, this is very much inside the kernel, and the kernel can at, use this as an additional source of entropy for something like dev random. Um, again, all of the details are in the paper, so I'd encourage people to have a look at that because I can't do it all justice here. So the final issue that we had to deal with when designing the scalar extension was to handle or how to handle constant time behavior. So the problem being that all code that handles cryptographic secrets must execute in constant time, uh, by which we mean the execution latency of the code mustn't depend on the values being computed on, because if there's a correlation there, you can uh, reduce the security of the um, cryptographic construction being used considerably. Um, and the ISO, the base ISO for RISC-V currently has absolutely no guarantees about critical instruction behavior. So in, in this case, what we really care about is integer multiply and carryless multiply. Uh, integer multiply for uh, most sort of uh, public key encryption schemes and carryless multiply for AES GCM, which is a really common mode of operation for uh, TLS. Um, the solution we hit upon was to basically provide a hint to the microarchitecture using the relationship between the RS1 and RS2 register addresses. Um, so if RS1, the address, is less than or equal to RS2, then the architecture must execute the instruction in constant time. So um, there's no sort of early out multipliers, for example. Um, this also applies to fusible instruction sequences like uh, mul h then mul. Um, instructions where the um, RS1 address is greater than RS2, it's not guaranteed to be constant time, but it may still be. Um, so this really only affects calls that do data-dependent optimizations of multiply anyway. Um, if, if your core implements multiplies all in constant time, no matter what they are, um, then you don't need to worry about this hint. It's really only for calls that um, do data-dependent execution this way. Um, and it's also only needed by calls that do the uh, scalar crypto extension. So it's backward compatible with everyone out there who's already implemented things like the M extension um, or is uh, very far along with the B extension. Um, the reason we really needed to do this was because the ISA must provide some sort of security guarantee in this regard. Um, and we figured that a, a non-cryptographic multiplication can much more easily handle constant time execution than a cryptographic construction can handle non-constant time execution. If you don't have this, then your crypto can really only be used offline. Um, and that's an absolute disaster for most people. Uh, so this is really important, but potentially quite contentious. So we're looking for lots of feedback for this during the public review. So now we've seen all the main components of the scalar extension, uh, now I can show you the way we've grouped them together uh, into feature sets that we expect people to actually implement. Um, there are three main groups, uh, the NIST algorithm suite, the Shangmi algorithm suite, and the entropy source extension. Um, so these are the actual feature sets that we expect people to go and implement. Um, each major sort of uh, algorithm uh, feature set includes all of the bit manipic instructions as well, so that you've got like a common base of instructions to uh, always rely on as well. Um, there are also very fine grain groups uh, with specific sets of instructions in them, so if people want to be um, extremely uh, choosy about which instructions they implement, say they've got a very resource constrained device, that's still okay, um, but the main sort of three groups we expect people to implement are listed there. Um, the idea being to minimize the number of feature sets that software needs to support, because the more you have half of those, the more difficult it gets to write things like common software libraries. Um, we are looking for feedback on these during public review because uh, grouping together instructions is always quite difficult, particularly when you've got to anticipate future changes. Um, but these are the groups we've settled on for now. Um, to wrap up, um, in terms of the performance and area impact, you can see some of our experimental benchmarking results there. Um, for the RV32 ISC, you can implement the entire thing for about the same cost as the Rocket Core multiplier, just to give you a sort of very ballpark figure for a not too optimized implementation. Uh, and now we're moving towards um, public review. We'd like people to start looking at um, creating optimal implementations. So if you're someone who's interested in this, we'd really like to hear from you about your experiences. Um, so to sum up the cryptography extent, the scalar cryptography extension, um, the sort of takeaways are that we borrow several generic instructions from Bitmanip that are useful for cryptography. So if crypto is the thing that you need, you only need to implement the parts of Bitmanip that are very useful for it. You don't need to implement the whole thing. And this keeps the uh, instruction set very general. Um, we've got dedicated instruction support for SHA-2, AES, SM3, and SM4. So these are the very, very popular uh, block ciphers and hash functions in protocols like TLS. 
Um, and we've also defined the entropy source interface for generating cryptographic secrets and a uh, proper usage model for how that can be used safely and securely. Next up is Barry, who's going to talk about the vector extension. Hello, my name is Barry Spinney, and I'm going to be talking about the vector cryptography, cryptography extension. Um, this uh, extension it was with the original um, charter of the group, and it was based upon doing uh, using the RISC-V vector extension and adding to it. Because it depends on the RISC-V vector extension, which has changed significantly, uh, it, was, it, it was a challenge to actually get all these uh, structures organized and, and, and decided upon. Uh, one of the interesting things about the vector crypto extension is that it uses very large element sizes. I think much larger than even the vector uh, extension committee thought uh, was was uh, likely to be the case. In particular, it uses element sizes from 128 bits up to 1,024 bits as elements. Not these are not this is not the size of the actual vector, just the uh, single element of the vector. So this is accomplished. Uh, with either very wide vector registers, or there's a new feature in the vector spec called um, LMAL, which is a length multiplier. And when LMAL is greater than one, multiple physical registers are concatenated together, forming one single large logical register, which then can then be broken up into multiple um, vector elements, or just having one could just have one vector element. The, this picture here shows the example uh, for a couple of different algorithms. Not all the algorithms we do, but a couple of the algorithms of the vector element size uh, that is um, that we use in these instructions. Uh, for example, the Shaw instructions, the message schedule is the largest um, element. Now, actual fact, the message schedule is actually much larger than what's shown here uh, because it actually can have uh, either 64 to 80 element and in each element is 32 bits or 64 bits, but it turns out that for calculating the message schedule, you never need to go back more than six, 15 different previous message schedule um, uh, values, and so you only need to have a window that is the size of 16 times the actual message uh, data width. So that means that for SHA-256 and 224, you have a 512-bit uh, element size or state that is needed to be processed. And for 512, which is also the same algorithm as 384, you need to have 1,024-bit, which is actually quite quite large. AES is a little bit simpler um, because it only has it has a common state, even though it has three different key sizes. And the AES state is always 128 bits, whereas the key schedule uh, or the key uh, itself is either 128, 192, or 256 bits. <clears throat> so the um, um, the basic idea of the vector extension is is uh, it allows us to get a much higher performance levels, or more specifically, much higher ratios of cryptography compared to instruction the number of instructions executed, because a single instruction can now work on uh, a very large number of different computations, different blocks. So the, this gives us two types, dimensions of parallelism. We have parallelisms for a single vector element, because the hardware itself does these in, uh, operations in parallel typically. For example, for AES, you would typically see uh, at a high end uh, a whole bunch of parallel S boxes. Uh, often 16 for each vector element to process a, a, a single round uh, of more in one clock cycle. So that gives you a fair bit of parallelism. But then you also have parallelism across vector elements. So you can you potentially have thousands of S blocks uh, in hardware in parallel running at the same time. And that gives you very, very high performance and uh, almost similar performance as you might get with an accelerator block. So the vector approach used by RISC-V is actually um, often compared to the SIMD approach used by 
the Intel uh, A AAS NI instructions or the RV8 uh, AS and Shaw uh, crypto extension instructions, but they're actually fairly different. Those two uh, systems use what I would call a, a SIMD approach, where you don't have a, a true array of operands. You really just have a single uh, computation you're doing at a time, and the, you use these 128-bit registers that uh, to hold your um, operands in. And of course, we, as we just saw, 120 bits is not enough for some of these operations. And so, what that what that meant was that that for AES it works okay, but for things like SHA 512, uh, neither of these things originally supported that because with 128 bit registers, you can't uh, take a lot of registers to actually get. Uh, in registers, all the state needed to actually do a proper message schedule computation for SHA 512. But it can do be done for SHA 256 as Armin has shown. So, um, SIMSI is sort of, I guess, way to think of it is it's like using, uh, the vector approach of this architecture, but using only single element vectors, or vectors that have only one element in that is a perfectly legitimate uh, constraint. In fact, many implementations of the RISC-V vector crypto may actually uh, restrict things to actually be, in some cases, single element. But the but but the way the architecture of vectors work, these vector elements can be have many more uh, uh, than one element, and you know therefore implementations can actually be are almost unbounded in the performance. So, um, a couple of different dimensions that we're going to talk about today is a lot of these uh, different uh, crypto uh, instructions are come in different flavors. And one common theme is you'll see there's what's called per round and all round instructions. And when we say per round, I, I really don't want to be too literal there because it really doesn't necessarily mean that we do uh, the instruction only does one round uh, per instruction, but it could be multiple rounds and often it is. Whereas the instructions that are the all rounds really do do all rounds uh, that are required for the SHAWs and the AES instructions. And uh, that, uh, we'll get to showing what they look like in a few moments. So first I'm going to talk about the SHA-2 instructions that are the vector of crypto instructions. But before I do, I just want to kind of go over this picture with you that shows um, the basic concepts of how SHA Two, 256, 512, all work. All the different SHA algorithms, SHA-2 algorithms work very much like this. And this is actually a, a little different than a lot of pictures you might see even in Wikipedia, because a lot of times in Wikipedia they may only show the middle stage. So here I'm actually showing that what actually happens is the input data comes in being read in and either, depending on the, the SHA-256 or 512, either you bring it in 512 bits or 1,000 bits. And you bring it into here and you load it into your message schedule state. And then you have some logic that takes that message schedule state and processes it and comes up with the next message schedule state for the next uh, batch. And, and at the same time, it takes the message schedule state or just a piece of it, just the, the uh, single element of it, single piece of it, either 32 bits or 64 bits and brings that over into, uh, into the working state, exports it right in. The working state is shown here. The work state has, um, has again, a bunch of registers. Um, it takes uh, eight, um, either 16 or 32-bit registers that it works with. And there's a bunch of logic that actually will mix those registers uh, up uh, on every single uh, round. And this shows basically how we actually take the message schedule input, bring it into this middle stage, and then how the middle stage creates a next um, set of working state, so because it actually compute, takes in uh, eight registers and produces eight registers, and here we show it coming back in through the MUX as well. And then, uh, of course, we have the final state, which is all called the hash state. A lot of times people forget about this and think that the working state is the hash state, but it is not. The hash state is a, 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 another eight words of either five uh, uh, 64 bits or 32 bits that is kept uh, in a separate set of registers in the working state. The hash state is updated with much less frequency. The working state is, at, in, is updated on every round as is the message schedule from, from most of the, at least in the early rounds. 
Whereas only when you've done a whole set series of rounds of 64, 80 rounds, then what actually happens is the working state gets brought over here and gets added in to either the initial state or the current hash state. The current hash state then is used to initialize the working state for the next 64 to 80 rounds. And then, of course, the output is coming out here, the output digest, which comes, which is just literally a copy of the hash state, uh, potentially uh, byte swapped. So, what does this mean for uh, trying to implement this in RISC V in crypto instructions? So, um, first thing that I want to point out here is that the instructions that are being used here for SHA 2 are actually the same instruction opcode for both the 236 bit version and the 512 bit version, even though, of course, they're, you know, they have, have some very different properties. They actually have slightly different algorithms. And, and also, of course, one is using 32 bit uh, values and the other one's using 64 bit values. And this is actually dealt with because these are, we, we call these instructions polymorphic because they actually have, uh, they, 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 how they work depends upon this uh, VSEW, uh, the SEW or VSEW stands for the standard element width. So a register in the vector spec that describes what the standard element width is that's currently being used by the vector unit. And if the VSEW standard element width is equal to 256 bits, that means you're using doing a shot 256 bit computation. And if it's 512, then you're doing a shot 512. And any other value will create an illegal operand exception, legal instruction. So now we also, so that's one thing, but we actually have to support both things with a very small number of opcodes. And that was a requirement early on that we basically minimize our opcode usage. In addition, we actually have different instructions for the different stages, which I just showed you before, the different stages of the message schedule, working state, and the hash state. So the first, uh, stage is the message schedule state. And this instruction, is, which is being used, is, which is VSHA2MS, standing for message schedule, dot VV means the vector to vector instruction. It uses two vector registers. It processes actually 16 rounds at a time. And, um, and so basically it can go very fast. So you don't need to use a lot of these instructions to actually create your message schedule. The next stage is the working state. And it also has, the instruction we use here is very similar. It's called vsha 2 WSI for a working state. And the I basically indicates that it's an immediate, there's an immediate operand as well. And uh, it has uh, these, these three registers. And it processes also uh, 16 rounds at the same time. Now, one of the differences between the message schedule, which is that it's, the message schedule is very symmetric. The algorithms used to update the message schedule every 16 rounds don't depend upon where you are in the message, in the, in the, in the what round number you're using. Whereas for the working state, it actually does. And the reason is that there are different round constants that need to be applied, and those round constants are changed on every single round. So when we run this instruction, we need to know not just that, what the uh, current uh, state is, we need to also know what the what round we're doing. And so for that, we have a three-bit literal operand called RND, which is used to specify which round you are. Now, logically, you can specify the round to be either 0, 16, 32, 48, or 64, just for SHA-512. The, the first uh, four values are only needed for SHA-256, whereas all five are needed for 512. And um, um, the, the, these actually values, this is a very, as you might know, this is only a three bit literal operand. These are the logical values. They're actually encoded into a three bit operand. So we don't actually pass such large literal values into the instruction. And then finally, we have the hash state, which if you go again back here, these pluses basically represent addition, true additions, not uh, additions of the working state into the hash state every, once you've done a certain number of rounds for a single input message block. And that actually is implemented just by using standard vector addition instructions. Uh, and there's nothing uh, special that we don't have any special instructions 
to, to do that part of it. In addition, we also support an all-round SHA-2 instruction. And this instruction handles all the stages in all rounds. And it's also polymorphic, just like the program version. So it's actually just one single powerful instruction. V SHA-2 HS VD. And it basically operates, uh, takes uh, the, the, the input uh, method, input um, data here in, in VRS, and then takes the initial state and then computes the final state uh, of the hash state. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the AES vector crypto instructions. Um, unlike, they, they don't have three states, but they do have two stages. Specifically, they have a stage where they have to create the key schedule. And what this is, is you take the keys that you're given, the, the 128, 192, 2 big keys, and you basically scramble them and iterate over them to create a set of round keys so that every round in the AES processing, there will be uh, a 128-bit round key that's brought in and XORed in to keep uh, the AES uh, algorithm mixing things very thoroughly. So the AES state actually is always the same, depending independent of the key size. It's always 128 bits of the AES state, and so is the round key. But what is not uh, 128 bits is the actual initial key, which is used to create the key schedule. Unlike the um, previous case of the Shaw instructions, where the Shaw instructions the message schedule operates on every single input block, input data block that is brought in. The, um, the a in AES, the data is brought into the AES state, but the key is only brought into the key schedule. And because of this, the key schedule, if you have a whole series of data blocks, this is typical, being processed with the same AES key, you don't have to recalculate the um, key schedule every time. You can actually calculate it once and save it away and reuse that key schedule um, over and over and over again. Now, on the other hand, if it's fast enough and efficient enough, you may actually want to recreate the key schedule on every single input block in parallel with your AES. And part of the reason for that is, of course, it's going to take, you still have to have that logic for the key schedule, so you it's not going to, you can't really, you save some power, but you don't like to save any case by trying to optimize that out. And in addition, this way you don't have to have all this extra state because the key schedule does take a fair bit of uh, state. And if you compute the key schedule on the fly, so to speak, for AES, that's a fair bit of, a very large amount of state in flip flops that need to, can be saved. And um, so it really depends on the use case, uh, whether you, which, which approach is the best one. As I said before, there are three key sizes, and the, but in all cases, we use a vector element size of 128 bits. All the vector elements are 128 bits. So what are we talking about when we talk about vector element here? This, this is a good example. So what we're really talking about is we're, having, we're talking about having an array of input blocks. Every input block in the AES is 128 bits a whole array of them, which could be fairly arbitrarily large. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that input block and we're going to plot that whole array of input blocks. Each one is independent of the other. And we're going to apply the AES algorithm in parallel on each element at the same time. Now, that does not allow for the elements to affect each other. So you can't do things like uh, AES CDC um, is, is uh, in an array fashion. You can do things like AES GCM because AES GCM is parallelizable and you can actually implement the different um, AES uh, uh, um, ciphers in parallel because the inputs are independent and you can have one set of key schedules shared among them all. In addition, we also have to deal with the case that in the fact that we have different instructions and algorithms for the encrypt versus the decrypt case for AES. And those will cause different instructions, as we'll see. So, the first thing I want to talk about is the instructions we need to do to accelerate the key schedule. Even though the key schedule is only, in theory, used once per 
uh, it's not the key schedule is not needed to be computed. So if, if I'm capturing a 1024 byte uh, packet that needs to be encrypted or decrypted, well, the 1024 uh, byte packet would imply basically 64 input blocks, 64 different AES computations, and only needs to have one key schedule calculated, and they can be amortized over those 64 blocks. But it still is a, a, a for very small uh, uses, very small packets, which is often an important consideration for a lot of systems. If you only have a 64 or a 96 byte packet, then the ratio of the key schedule cost is pretty is relatively high, and we actually then care about uh, having good performance for the key schedule. So in this uh, presentation, as we've seen before with the some of the stuff that Ben did, but specifically here, when we talk about the register uh, being VRT, we're always referring to a register that's being used as a source and a destination vector register. When we talk about a register that's only used for holding sources, we'll call it VRS, one or two, and when we talk about a register that's only used as a destination, not as a source and desk, we'll use the, the, the nomenclature VRD. So the AES key schedule needs to know what round we're in because, again, it's not fully symmetrical uh, because there is a round constant that is brought in on the different rounds. And the way we specify that is by having an operand called RND, which is a four-bit immediate that, uh, that is basically used to tell the key schedule which, how you do that algorithm. It's basically used to look, do a lookup into a table of um, round constants called Archon. So we actually also have, uh, for the, in the crypt and the decrypt, we have different variants of these key schedules depending on the key size. And so you can see we have VAES-128, key I, key, the I referring to the fact that we have an immediate, and uh, the VV referring to the fact that it's vector vector. And we use this. Now these instructions only do one round um, computate one round of the key schedule. So you need to invoke them uh, either uh, 10 times, 12 times, or, or either 13 times. So this over here shows what the legal values of the round constant is, is allowed to be for these instructions. And in particular, it's important to know that the, for encrypting, you always, the round will always be incre increasing. So if I have a unrolled loop, I'll, for 128, I'll see the first round being 1, the next one being 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 10. And for 256 big keys, I'm going to go all the way up to 14. And you might wonder why I don't start at 1. And that's because for 256 big keys, the first two round constants come right from the uh, 256 bit input keys, so there's no computation needed for the very first round. <clears throat> and the crypt schedule is, looks very similar, uh, but of course it has the word inverse here for inverse key. And there's a slight very difference in what the round numbers are, but the most important difference is, even though this shows that the round numbers have to be for 128, between 0 and 9, the round numbers actually, if you unroll the loop, will actually go backwards. They will actually decrease for the decrypted key schedule. So uh, for a, a 128 uh, key schedule, you would call this instruction first with a round of 9, 8, 7, 6, all the way down to 0. So now we're going to talk about the two different kinds of, um, so there's actually three different kinds of AES instructions that we support. First, the per round instructions. Per round instructions actually are divided into even themselves two different categories. We call vector scalar instructions and vector vector. So the next one's going to be vector vector, and this one's vector scalar. The difference between these two is, besides the fact that they have the same name except for one is VS and one is VV here, um, is that basically the round key is held constant. So in the vector scalar case, even when we call it scalar, we're still not, it's not truly a scalar in the sense that it's not using one of the regular registers. 
but it's using um, the, re the vector element, the vector array that is being applied that only has one element. If it has more than that element, they're not, it's not looked at. So basically the idea is that the VRT register is a source test register holding the current and the, then the next state of the AS state. So when you first run this instruction, the VRT register will hold the current state on the input, and that input will be then mixed with the uh, the, the current round key, and then it will be written back into VRT as the next AES state to be used. And again, these only do one round per clock cycle per instruction, unlike the Shum the Shaw instructions we saw before, which can do up to 16, which do 16 rounds per instruction. Um, <clears throat> so the important thing here to know is that this, that basically even though this can be an array, the VRT can be an array, it could be an array of one, but it could be an array of 20 different uh, AES blocks, each of six, being 16 bytes long. In all cases, the round key that's being passed in is always the same round key for all of them. And this is a, a common case where basically I may be doing, like say, a GCM computation where I'm using um, the, the same round key for all these computations, but I have different data that I'm encrypting. So I can actually encrypt all these different, this array of data in parallel. And uh, the other point that we have to emphasize here is that AES is almost symmetrical in the, its algorithm of doing the AES main state processing. The difference is that the last round is different because it omits the mixed columns transformation. And so we actually, solve that by actually having a different instruction for the final round and uh, that way we just don't lose a lot of, we don't lose any of our performance so we actually we use the AESE instruction for you know the first bunch of the rounds all the rounds up to the last one and then this last instruction would be used just for the final round and this looks exactly the same way for the scalar vector decrypt case other than the fact that the AES E is now AESD. Next we're going to show you the, the vector vector instructions. And the vector vector instructions, basically in this case we actually have the, um, the BRS register holding not a single round key, but it has a round key for every single different uh, data element in the, in the uh, source test state. So this way you can actually have a different type of computation like where I'm actually doing totally unrelated ADS computations, each one having its own data block and uh, its own round key. Finally, we come to the all round AES instructions. So one of the primary motivations of having the AES round is, uh, all round instructions is, was originally to, to help mitigate against differential power attacks. It is believed by some that um, trying to do differential power attack mitigation when you have the, the state is being done on a per round basis is, is really very difficult to get good um, protection. Now, of course, it also is a good motivation is that also still allows us to get the best performance uh, and allows us to, in particular, have very low overhead for the amount of instructions to kick off AES operation. If you have a vector a unit that can support uh, quite a number, an array of, a large number of vector elements, not just one vector element, but quite a number of them, then the performance of kicking off these instructions of all rounds as an array of operations, to an array of them at the same time, is probably, uh, is, is, is maybe even more or as, as efficient as using some external AES um, acceleration unit, which is uh, uses DMA to bring its data in and out. So we, just like before, we have both versions of the vector scalar and the vector vector versions. And we have different versions, different instructions for the decrypt, for decrypt case and the different key sizes. So first, the vector scalar instructions. So here they look very, very similar to what we saw before, but they have, their a little different. They have their size put in there. So they have uh, vector AES encrypt, but with 128 bit algorithms and it uses vector scalar and it has almost the same um, 
encoding. Again, the, in this particular case, the VRS holds just the initial cipher key, which is common. It's common to all to all the the array of data that you're being encrypting. So just even though this is a vector register, it only holds a single element. That's only and if, it does, if the vector register has more than one element, only the zeroth element will actually ever be used. And similarly, we have the decrypt version where we have the E replaced with a D, and we have the three versions of the different key sizes, and otherwise it looks pretty much the same. And then we also have the vector vector instructions. And here, the, the difference is that even though it looks superficially the same, um, first of all, the way you tell is the VV versus VS, but also the, what this means is the, this initial cipher key is not a single cipher key. It's not a single element, but an array of elements corresponding one to one to the elements of your current state. So that way you can actually, again, have a situation where, uh, when I'm uh, do, doing the, the, the processing, I can actually have a whole bunch of different keys for every one of the input blocks that I want to process. And of course, both cases are fairly common. So, so we're now going to switch gears a little bit here and now talk about some of the remaining uh, vectorized cases that we've, so we've been looking at researching for doing the vector uh, crypto extension. Um, one of the other important use cases that are uh, common uses uh, for accelerated instructions involves carryless multiply. Sometimes, and this is basically the primary use case for this is supporting Galois counter mode. Now, uh, XTS also uses uh, a type of Galois multiply, but its um, use is so much simpler that this wouldn't justify this instruction because you can actually do it just by using shifts. But for GCM, you do need to have something uh, better because doing uh, carryless multiply uh, um, in soft, in, 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 without a hardware instruction to support it, doing it in software is extremely expensive. So when we say, by the way, uh, carryless multiply, basically what it means is it basically looks like an irregular multiply, but you have you just XOR all the the, the bits in each column, but there's no carry from one column to the other. So in some ways, it's actually can be done with um, fewer gates and run faster, but it is very different than a regular multiply. Um, so we actually have multiple versions of this as well. We have widening versions, uh, which and single width and um, versions. The widening version basically what it means is it basically takes the two multiple, the multiplier and the multiplicands, and multiplies them together to get a double width result, which is then written to the destination. So this is a case where you, the vector uh, operands are, are not the same size. The input operands are, have one size, and the output operands uh, elements are, are double the size. Alternatively, you can also implement uh, the single width versions. Now, when you do a single width versions, because when you're doing a carry this multiply or any kind of multiply, if I have an n bit times an n bit operands, I generally result in a two n bit result. You have, we have to decide, well, how do we store that away? And so the way these instructions work is there's a low version and a high version. So the low version, when it's executed, still produces the same double width result, but only the low half is written to the destination register. And the, the single width carry this multiply high, it does the same instruction, same result, carried, but only the half perhaps is written to the destination. This may actually seem a little inefficient, maybe it is a little bit, because when you use these uh, low and high instructions, you actually use them in pairs. And when you do the low instruction, the hardware, for the most part, has to do with the same work as doing for, for the low and the high. And then when you do the high, it then has to do it again to the same work times two. Um, and but some ar architectures um, allow for these instructions to be merged, uh, it coalesced in a way so that the system can recognize that you have a low and a high instruction one after another and actually not have to waste the same hardware, not actually do the computation twice and do it once and then redirect the low half and the high half to the different. Uh, output registers. So in addition, these, these instructions have different flavors, which one of the flavors are having a multi regular multiply version and a multiply with accumulator version. 
So let's take a look at these. So we have the vector scalar instructions. The, again, we're going to first talk about the single width case where we have both the low and the high um, um, instructions. And here when we have vector scalar, we do, we do the same sort of thing we talked about before. We have the, the output, the destination vector register, and in the first register, which is the multiplier, only element zero of that given register vector uh, is used. Whereas in the second vector source register, it has an array of multiple cans, which would be the same size as the array of the destination uh, vector register. And so this shows the instructions. We, these instructions are called vector carry the CL mull vector scalar. And you, there's a, if you don't see an, a, a, an L, a, a, another letter after the L, that means it's, it's going to just store away the low bit for that multiply. And if it has an H, it will store away the high bit for the multiply. So here, it, this equation doesn't quite do it justice. It does show the, the VRS1, it, it only uses the zeroth element. And for the arrays uh, of the input array and the output array, they're both indexed by I but over the whole set of array elements. Where the multiply, logically, there's a, you can think of it as a, a, a low function operating on the product. And here, it just is a high function, which is basically a shift. Same sort of instructions, but instead of saying L mole, the CL mole is said CL MAC, M A C C, referring to the fact that this is an accumulate instead of a, just a multiply. So in, in C, we would write that as a plus equals here. And so in this case, the register is um, actually a um, source and a dest because, the, because after you do the multiply, you take the result and add it to the um, output register. Now here add, by the way, it's a misnomer, it's actually an XOR because it's all a Galois field arithmetic. So these is the corresponding vector to vector versions of these the same instruction. Uh, again, the major diff the only difference really is that instead of being VS, it's VV here, has both the um, regular uh, multiplies and the accumulated ones, and also the low and the high and the low and the high. <clears throat> and if you look over here, you see the big only difference here is that instead of being the zeroth element for the multiplier, it uses the corresponding the ith element for both the multiplier and the multiplicand. And finally, we come to the widening careless multiplier, which is you know, the maybe the, 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 the conversion that people most most want to have. Except if you're a hardware uh, logic designer, which is probably also the hardest one to implement, is the, the widening one. So here, you again, we have a vector scalar version. So the vector scalar one, basically, for the way you tell it is a widening one. You see the W, you have VW CLMO and VW CLM act for accumulate. And the, again, the, the, in both cases, they're a scalar, which means that they only use the very first element of the vector register uh, is, is used to actually do the, do the product. Again, this is a, even though the star shows a star, you have to understand that it's actually care of this multiply, not general purpose multiply. To do this, to affect this thing, you need to set your L mall uh, to two, which is basically what we saw earlier, where you take two um, different uh, registers and you basically concatenate them logically into one uh, large register, which means you have half the number of registers, but the registers have twice as much bit width. And then we have the vector to vector widening ones, which again, you have the W, the two VVs, and instead of just only using the one element, you actually have the pair, the corresponding elements that have in the whole array for the both operand, the multiplier and for the multiplicand. Finally, the last thing I want to go over is some other instructions where we have, uh, that we've been doing some research on to help out for, to, to make um, vector crypto a little easier. Um, these are not true crypto instructions, but they're really instructions needed in support of uh, a lot of the crypto uh, vector instructions because, for example, there's a lot of need for rotates and also bit swaps and byte swaps. Uh, in order to get those uh, previous instructions in the right form. Because a lot of times, even though I really glossed over it today, 
the input forms and the, the actual instructions do not work and have the same bit ordering. So a lot of times we will have to uh, first bring in the, uh, the data and byte swap it or bit swap it before you use the instructions that we previously showed. And then that's all we have for the vector uh, crypto instructions and the vector ones. So again, I want to thank Ben for doing the first half of this and uh, hopefully if you have any questions, you can ask them now. Thank you.